the floor over you. Walking the floor. I'm walking the floor. Walking the floor over you. Hola, senors and senoritas. What's happening? This is Chris Shiflett, and you are listening to another fine edition of Walking the Floor. I've been running all over the place, man. Let me tell you about it. I was out at Americana Fest a couple weeks ago, then back home for a few days, and I turned around and went back out to Louisville and Nashville for a couple of Foo Fighter gigs. Got to hang out with my good buddy Adam Kurtz, pedal steel aficionado over there at Pilgrimage, and uh, and I actually managed to squeeze in another Walking the Floor interview. I got a lot of them in the can. When I was just in Nashville, I interviewed um, Nashville legend Tony Brown. Coming soon. If you don't know who Tony Brown is, Google him. From gospel to playing with Elvis to playing with Emmy Lou Harris to being a producer and an AR guy running a label. I mean, this guy has had his fingers in everything for a long time out there, man. I think he's been in Nashville since the late 60s, and it's a great, super long, crazy long conversation that we had. I think it was just like a two hour interview. I might have to break that up into two parts. We'll see. I don't know if you can handle it, people. All right, now tomorrow uh, I'm leaving again back uh, out there in the world, heading down to Rio. Um, and I'll be back in about a week and a half going to Bogota, going to Costa Rica. It's going to be a, a fun trip. And, uh, oh yeah, before I forget, uh, there's a low ticket alert for my late night ACL gig down there in Austin at the Continental with the Cordovas and Leon the Third. Not many tickets left, not a huge room, so get your tickets today and let's sell that thing out, people. Come on! Okay, now, now I want to talk to you about my good friends over there at Zounds.com. Did you know that Zounds has three warehouses strategically located across the United States to get you your gear faster than anyone else? And that over 90% of Zounds orders arrive within two days or less? And did you know that you get free shipping on every order? I bet you didn't know that. So get on over to Zounds.com and get your gear today. All right, let's get on over to today's interview. All right, so a week or so ago, uh, while I was out there at Americana Fest in Nashville, Tennessee, I was lucky enough to get together with Yola for this live taping in front of a real crowd at the West in Nashville around noon on the Friday. Uh, she had a huge buzz on her this year and, and, you know, was one of those artists that, like, everybody was talking about and was like, oh, you gotta go see Yola. Uh, so I'm sure her schedule was nuts. Mine was nuts, but I'm sure hers was probably, like, ten times nuttier than mine. So big thanks to Yola and all her people and everybody at Americana Fest for helping to make this happen, because it was great. Uh, as a black woman from England, Yola definitely sticks out a bit in the white bread world of Americana music. We talked about that. We talked a lot about the glass ceiling of the white brotocracy that she endured coming up in her hometown over there in Bristol, England. She's a self-professed nerd who's had a very interesting life and career, so make sure to check out her latest record, Walk Through Fire, the title of which was inspired by literally catching on fire when her flat burned down. Uh, And it was uh, produced and co-written by Dan Auerbach from Black Keys, And uh, he also put it out through his label, Easy Eye Sound. He's always producing and writing and putting out cool music. So definitely check this one out. Um, I wound up having way too many questions and not enough time. So hopefully we'll do it again sometime down the line. But for now, this is Yola on Walking the Floor. Hello, Nashville. How is everybody doing today? How's Americana Fest? I know we're getting into the long end of the week where those late night cervezas and bad dietary choices are beginning to catch up with everybody. But I'm gonna tell you what I told the crowd yesterday. We need you to be nice and rowdy because we don't always do these uh, live walking the floor podcast tapings. And uh, We just need to forget that we're in a well-lit hotel ballroom right now, so just take your mind somewhere else. It's three in the morning in a smoke-filled bar, and we're gonna get uh, get kooky here. All right, so 
Uh, I have a, uh, uh, a podcast called Walk on the Floor. My name is Chris Shiflett. Very nice to meet you. Thanks for coming down. Give a nice, warm Nashville welcome for my guest today, Yola, all the way from Bristol. How you doing? All right. I see you got your coffee tech, bringing your coffee out, yes. ready to go. It's English breakfast tea. Nice. You can't take the girl out of England, you know? Of course not. Well, you can, but you can't take it out of the girl. <laughs> well, you've been, you've been out of England a lot this year, right? Oh, my God, have I, yes. You've been touring a lot over here, haven't you? Yeah, I put together the amount of time uh, that I'm spending here, um, just on and off since January. And I was like, isn't this about six months? So I think I live here. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to America. Hey! <laughs> and, and on, uh, you know, touring, touring the States is, for anybody that's ever toured out there, knows that touring the States and touring the UK are very uh, different logistical animals. So how, uh, how do you like our 17-hour drives between shows? Uh, <laughs> like, have, have you tried to kill your booking agent yet? Uh, I haven't tried to kill them yet, you know. That would really va invalidate my visa. Yeah. Murder. <laughs> so I'm trying to stay away from the murder, but um, I definitely have had a foot down on the kind of mornings functionality of my voice uh, yeah. kind of situation. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. not a lot of thought on the other side of things put into like, well, she played a gig till two in the morning last night. Let's get her into a radio station at 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> to do a song and be really bubbly. Yeah, and super enthusiastic. <laughs> oh, and by so. the way, it's 10 hours away. Oh, yeah. No, no problem. Like, oh, wow. Yeah. So I need a, uh, some form of time traveling device. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't get that. No, um, no did we're you, over that now. Did your latest record, like, did it just kind of blow up right away? It feels like, you know, anytime yeah. there's an artist that, <laughs> that seems to sort of jump on the scene out of nowhere, there's always a big backstory. And exactly. You've got a backstory. But, but did this new record kind of blow up right away and, and if so why this one um i think this one because it's my first full-length album i'm debuting right. so uh that i put out an ep yeah. um before that i basically learned to play the guitar through writing the ep really yeah and uh then i just thought immediately well well now i'm kind of playing this thing yeah. let's see let's just put the first songs that came out of my head on down to, you know, CD and just have something physical to engage with, to talk about. Mm. And uh, um, so I wrote that EP, I produced and mixed it, and then uh, with a wonderful guy um, from a studio in um, West London. Mm. And then, yeah, well, I just kind of took that around and that was almost like my calling card. Right, Do right. you know what I mean? And so I came here 16 and 17. Um, 16, I had like early pressings of it. Yeah. Um, and then 17, I actually kind of had it kind of thing. And so that's kind of what I was doing. I was kind of trying to build up from taking a bit of a hiatus for music for a few years. Um, I was kind of in a band previous to that. Sure, Phantom Limb, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was the main top liner, but I found myself kind of quite ambiguously guiding the chord structures because I'd be like, well, the song's kind of going like this, right. so I kind of need the chords to go in this direction. Yeah. And so without writing the chords, I was guiding the chords. And I was like, I'm kind of doing the job. And you didn't play guitar at that point? No. Did you play piano or anything? Nothing. It really? was all just top lines, lyrics, melody. Well, you, and I was the only explain, one that did lyrics and melody. Can in you explain like, to people that don't know what a top liner is? What is that term? Yeah, so it's a job. It's a, by and large, collaborative job. Right. And you're essentially the person they call in to do the Bernie Taupin job. Or, right. <laughs> like, um, someone's sent you, if you're in pop, you might get sent a backing track, and then they want you to respond to that backing track. Um, and you'll then put 
the lyrics and the melody over that backing track. What you can do sometimes is you can go back to the producer and go, I'm the writer producer, if that's electronic, um, I need to restructure this for this mm. or for whatever reason. Or sometimes they'll respond by restructuring. Right, right. And right. so I spent my time um, first, I suppose as a kid, I went through jazz and then into the kind of pop EDM crossover sure. circuit because it dawned on me very few people um, kind of classically studied in that area. And so I'd kind of done a bit of opera training. I'd done um, just endless. I've been writing like right out of the pretty much from toddling, I'd always been writing. I had been releasing from about 16. And mm. so I had kind of, that's kind of where I wanted to go. And so I put myself in that environment and um, started releasing quite quickly. And I, um, that's kind of what went alongside the kind of phantom limb thing because it made no money. It's, it, it absorbed so much money, but it created nothing. It was like a vacuum for, for anything. That sounds like my solo career. Genius. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for anything and an absolute absence of business sense. And I was in an environment that was very like, oh, you know, if you're a lady, you couldn't possibly have any solutions. Mm. And so, and I was like, you know, eight to 10 years, a lot of people's junior. And so right. that was like, I had juniorness, I had ladiness, I have person of colorness, and none of them were really kind of playing in my favor. And so. I, I, read, uh, a, I read a quote of yours. The slow nod of knowing, I'm saying that. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I read a quote of yours that made me think about my own musical upbringing. I think you, I think you were referring to, to your time growing up in the music scene in Bristol. Um, as a, you refer to it as a white broathon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and like where I, you know, I grew up in a, in a, I mean, I don't know what Bristol's like. I've been there a couple it's times. It's really on mixed in. Right. Yeah. And like I grew There's up no in, on the West it. Coast in a mid-sized city with a college and a lot of hippies and progressive yeah, people. Right. And but there were no young ladies in our music scene at all. You know, right. At all. It was as you a stated, white a white broathon. <laughs> Like, why is that? You know what I mean? Oh, it's the protocracy is real, you know? (laughs) Right, yeah. It's, uh, and I think people don't, cognitive bias is is the B word, you know? Right, right, right. Like, you don't know that you're constantly filtering out people. Sure. It's just that every time you're looking, you're thinking, oh, I need the most capable person I know. It just so happens to be a white guy. And there happen to be a lot of white guys in the West of the world that we live. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you're going to bump into a lot of white guys. Yeah. Like, it's going to happen. Like, yeah, especially you've got to find a way to navigate the proliferation of white guys. And, and, uh, <laughs> and alt country or Americana. No? Yeah. These are like, you know, kind of white male dominated yeah. genres. It's, it's everywhere. Right. And so, like, um, <laughs> you just have to learn to navigate the environment. Like, there are obviously as many women, and for some reason, they're not around, but they're becoming. This year, I've definitely noticed, certainly at this festival, um, I think, uh, can I say this? I'm going to say it. Um, (laughs) um, I think the award show was better off for the lady heaviness. Mm. I mean, musically, creatively, like, more entertaining, can I just say that? Yeah. I just, I was more entertained. I gave more of a crap about the music. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm a pretty brutal judge at school. <laughs> and I'll be like, no, nah, sorry. I don't care how big the person is. Not today. Not today. Right, right. Um, but I was like, legitimate. Oh, legitimate. <laughs> and that just kept happening. Like, who are some of the artists you're thinking about? Uh, well, um, Brandy's pretty legitimate. Right? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. <laughs> And uh, I've got to, I've got to say it, black myself. That song, Amethyst, native daughters, but Amethyst's voice is just, it's the real. That's from, that's from out of time. That does not just happen. I don't know what spaceship she came out of, but like, that doesn't just happen. That voice. That's, that's being a. Um, a student 
as much as it is just the genes playing right. a wonderful role and coming out and being just a fierce nerd, which she is, <laughs> you know? Um, um, did you yeah. have the experience, like, when you were first playing music with people and, you know, when, when you were younger? You know, and I say this, I, I'm, I apologize for my obvious ignorance here, but, you know, like, I we're talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm a white man, and, I, and, and so hey. I'm not, I'm not going to have... <laughs> ever the perspective of what it's like to be a woman that, coming up in, in, in rock and roll and music or whatever, right? <laughs> so did you, like, and did you have the experience of, of somebody going like, no, you can't play guitar. Yes. That's not for you. Don't yes. do that. No, fuck that. You, you can't it. do that. You nailed it. I did. I did. And I, um, my co-writer at the... <laughs> <laughs> How'd the rest of that writing session go? <laughs> <laughs> you could have made it up, could uh. you? It was perfect, yeah. No, no, because as you can, I've explained the job of top lining now, so you know the bit I'm not doing. So that's the bit I shouldn't do, right? Mm. If, I, if I do that, well, I'm doing all of it, then it's all over. So it's like, no, 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 you need me. No, 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 you don't have the inclination. Right. You shouldn't. And every time we touch it, like, burst out and laughing, <laughs> you can't do that. Just making sure I stay in my little box. And like, how did you and I respond? stay in circle? Well, I was you, in you my 20s. You don't 20s. seem like somebody that's, that's going to back down Not from that. Not like, because did you to 30s. That? 20s? Can we just all say what the 20s are? Everyone that's out of them now is laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I think looking around this room, we're all long out of them. <laughs> They're just laughing and laughing. I'm sorry, I, can, I, I know you two, and I know that you're not out of them yet. I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> You'll be wise like us someday, yeah. don't you worry. Don't you worry. <laughs> You'll learn the hard way, guys. Um, yeah, because um, yeah, you're a doormat in your 20s, sure. and you think you're a real badass, right? And you're not. You're a stone-cold doormat. That's what you are. And your standards are for, and... Uh, <laughs> oh, you can swear. This is the, oh, this goes, yes! this is the internet. You can say whatever Brits you want. Because Brits have dirty mouths. We're like terrified of guns, but we love swear words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, you're basically, your standards are for shit, you know? Yeah. You've got no kind of, like your boundaries are rubbish. And so you just allow this kind of rhetoric and you learn um, what's wrong. Because like any kind of like abuse or any kind of control, any kind of coercive activity is always insidious. It's never like obvious. It's never got a sign. I'm being evil. Right. Eh, 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 eh. Like that just like, that's Machiavellian activity is sure. is persuasive it is it can be reasoned at least from one highly misogynistic angle um and so um yeah like i was in an environment everything was tailored to keep me in my box it wasn't just me it was my company if there was someone who had the wrong kind of thought patterns they weren't cool and they weren't in there so absolutely everything the environment was tailored to serve the purpose. Well, there's also that thing when you're young and coming up where you don't want to blow an opportunity and you maybe keep your mouth shut over some things yeah. that you shouldn't and all that sort of, oh, yeah. this, this is going to be my big break and I'm going to fuck it all up. And well, kind of. I just didn't realize. I didn't have a good enough benchmark of humanity to start with. You know, I didn't have any... The standards weren't set high enough for me to know what was going wrong. If you don't have that solid home life, you don't have some good role models that go, oh, by the way, this is massively immoral, then you don't have um, something um, like the thing to compare it to. You don't have, oh, well, I grew up thinking this. And so I was basically, you get a lot of this in music, people that are connected to music for cathartic reasons, or like they have some pain, some hurt, they have something. Every time someone's a good songwriter, I ask them, what happened? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, oh, ooh, life couldn't have been easy. What happened? These songs are good. Yeah. Which means, <laughs> yes, something. You've got to not only have the thing that happened, but you have to actually be willing to dive into it. Yes, you know, exactly. And so 
that that kind of openness can lead to a vampiric kind of a, like um, friendship group. People that are very attracted to that and recognise maybe that some of those boundaries aren't quite in place yet. And if you're in the 20s, which is the whole time of not having boundaries, then that's just a double whammy. And so that's pretty much how I put this, this surface on. So I've always kind of had this badass surface. And also being a black woman doesn't help because everyone assumes that because you're a black woman that you are more impervious to harm than if you were, I was exactly the same personality in a tiny blonde casing. <laughs> you know? I'd say the same things, I'd have the same attitude, and it would all be perceived differently. Right. Specifically because I'm a dark skinned black woman as well. Colorism's a thing as well. If I was lighter skinned, that would be slightly different again. Everything kind of, um, certainly in my situation, was angled. And because of that assumption, you get even more neglect because people are like, oh, you'll be fine. Right. So you get all of that stuff, and then you'll get the you'll be fine. So then that compounds. And if you have any complaint, then it's because you're crazy, right, right. or you're angry, and angry is a very black woman thing. Right, right. And so you can't Coded talk language. anything about what's going on, right. because then you're transitioning into um, angry and if you go too far into angry then that's how you get to crazy and so <laughs> that's one step away from crazy yeah that's that's all it is that so you have no it doesn't like crazy no and yeah. it does not it does not and there's still obviously even the term crazy like we're starting to talk about mental health and stuff and yeah, yeah. like we, we ain't dealing with that stuff yet anyway even if you were being that which you're not so <laughs> yeah so that's the very long answer to your right. question. What's but how did you deal with that? I dealt with it very badly um, by just swallowing it all until it went into all my muscles, and I got vocal nodules. Really? Yeah. It and expressed itself physically. Right? Yes, as stress was, does. This was not only as as working as a top liner, but that this is also in phantom limb. Yeah, right? or just Same like the the process, the entirety of that environment of being in being young and of color in music, and you know, being a real nerd as well. Mm -hmm. Like I, it was very hard to kind of people were always surprised that you were a nerd and like. Like, I have nerd tastes. Like, I love Star Trek, and I love Harry Potter, and I love, like, I read a lot of, like, I was always like a Stephen King book or something. And, like, you know, like, I always had the kind of, I was, I watch almost exclusively sci fi. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and so, like, it was always like, I was always searching for people that were just adjacent to being cool. <laughs> You know? that's, that's our scoop for today. Uh, yeah. Yola is a nerd. <laughs> yes! Okay, so, so was, was, was there a point in all that? Like, was there one lightning bolt moment where you said, fuck these guys, I'm going, yes! be, I'm going solo. Right? <laughs> was, it, was it the nodes? Was that the moment? Yeah, for you you well, like, weirdly enough, no, shit. because, like, you're also encouraged to be forgiving and to right. get over things, and right. which these are all virtues, of course, but yeah. you know, so I. It's, it's a fine line between forgiving and being and locked being on, exactly, you know? exactly, and that's the one what you learn. Right. So that I had nodules, I was touring straight out of high school, um, on and off, like kind of, you, the great show, living on the street. Another great show, Job Seekers Allowance. Mm. Woohoo! Nodules. Yeah. Be so, <laughs> Feaster family. Yeah. yeah. And uh, um, I, I think about 23, I got nodules. And then I couldn't speak for two months and I couldn't sing for a year and a half. Jesus. And uh, so I was in a band called Bugs in the Attic, another band called the Cuban Brothers. And I and I did all sorts of other things in the kind of neo-soul kind of right. scene. And I dropped all of those jobs and I managed through serious negotiation to get what we used to have in the UK called incapacity benefit. Ah. And it was for people that were long-term injured that couldn't do their job. Right. And I'm like, I'm gonna explain everything, I'm gonna break it down. And then I, I was kind of really bummed out from not being able to sing. And so I got really, what we call in the West Country, sided up. <laughs> 
You get so you don't know. Is that like pissed? Yes, yeah, it so, is. Okay, yes, okay. you're fluent cool. in English. Well, I was going to ask English, you how English. you rehabbed your nodes, but yeah, maybe, you, maybe yeah. you went a completely different direction. Well, well, I'm, well you know what? I'm, <laughs> this kind of played into it, so I did get um, sidered up, a.k.a. pissed on cider. And uh, I started doing cartwheels um, on wet grass. I'm glad there's one laugh. Um, <laughs> because I just, I just traveled. I, was, I did like a handspring where you just go over and over, and I went over and over. And then on the third over, I was just surfing, and I was like, oh dear. I'm going to have to choose a leg to break. Were you looking for something other than music to, to, to do? Or is yeah, this point where at like, this I point, can't sing I can't do it. Over. Yeah, I was. I was, at this point, I had nothing. I was just like tumbleweed. Right. Oh, you know, for me, probably tumble fro. If you have fro hair, <laughs> you always live, leave little bubbles everywhere. You'll see them, they'll be everywhere, just twisting out the ends. Ooh, tumble fro. So there was some. <laughs> There's gonna be an eternity of black jokes up in this situation, okay? Like, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, um, luckily I broke my leg. So one, <laughs> luckily, <laughs> because then I really was like, if I was any kind of dis like disability kind of dispute, then I was like, yeah, and I also can't walk. So, <laughs> and they're like, okay, you're on. I'm like, I'm gonna be able to eat. So that was great. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I uh, and then they, I had loads of tramadol. Um, which is just like level below morphine mm. for the old opiates. Um, but luckily I don't have the addictive personality um, and addictive gene right. that, which is lucky because that stuff's too good. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you may have heard we have a bit of an opioid uh, Yeah, a slight opioid issue. I am yeah. super lucky that, like, that the genes didn't play that game with me. Wow. It's, uh, it's sugar. Yeah. Which is just that's just a whole black thing again, just the BTS, mm. um, and uh, that's cake. That's my problem. Yeah. I just do lines of cake. <laughs> <laughs> just like give me cakes, Victoria Sponge, just lines of Victoria Sponge uh. any day of the week, mate. I'll have it, freaking uh. English breakfast tea chaser. Yeah. So like, yeah. The upside was that I was so hi <laughs> that I couldn't be as so I saw how stress affects right. the vo vocal yeah, yeah. cords um, it was it's very hard to be stressed on that much tramadol and so <laughs> between that and obviously the rest and um, I got speech therapy but then speech therapy didn't really know about singing right. so then I had to develop I started stalking all these specialists in voice osteopathy in vocal biomechanics, in um, respiratory physiotherapy. I mean, prior to all that, were and you this somebody, is all my downtime. Did you take a lot of lessons? Did you Not have like technique and craft and all I that had, with your thing? I went to an opera school for maybe six months. Right. Um, that was just weekly lessons where I was just like, "Am I doing things safely?" Right. Going through my range, going through different kind of music that I was in yeah. and different environments, making sure that I was safe and like a little bit of stylistic, but it was all very much styled towards opera. So did you have to reinvent how you sang? No, the... because I didn't start in opera. I kind of, right. that was very much like um, end of high school kind of right, right, age. Right. I was just kind of seeing whether I had that within my kind of wheelhouse. Yeah. And so I was just interested in it. It was more of a study the style more than anything else. But I picked up a little bit of technical knowledge from that. Right. But um, most of it was in this period. Um, so I was just studying everything. And by the time I finished, I ended up kind of writing a little course for myself. And my voice started getting stronger mm. and until it was back. And then it was stronger than before I lost it. And then I was like, oh oh, how have I done that? And so um, I carried on doing that and then friends started asking me questions. Then university started asking me questions. Then I became a lecturer on the subject of vocal biomechanics. Oh, really? And yeah, and oh. I, had to, I ended up doing that until um, Massive Attack called me and we're like, uh, do you wanna, we've, we need a sub, super sub on the old vocals. Right. And so um, 
the same controlling person that I was dealing with. <laughs> we, you know, another one of the kind of like, it wasn't a white meritocracy in that sense situation, but it was definitely bro. Like, you know, yeah. it's a bro environment. But like, and, and they also, were really looking to like, get something new from Bristol. Right. And so that's what kind of ignited me at that time. But that's um, also very different musically very, than what we know you Exactly. For. So I was like, this is exciting because they're looking for something new from Bristol, but it's also absolutely nothing to do with me. And so <laughs> I was like, do you know what? Um, it'll be interesting, an interesting part of my life. And they're musically iconic as heck. And sure. so... I know. I just knew that I'd be something I could do, something inspirational that I could do for myself. We did a little bit of writing, but um, in the end, I just decided I need to keep on my path wow. of what I've been trying to do. Went back to the band, carried on doing top lining on the side, yeah, yeah. Um, and kind of saw that right through until I was like, you know what, this environment hasn't been working for me mm. in so many ways. Like, I've been gradually building up the top line in game that I was, as everyone's kind of um, reputations were building. But, you know, this kind of band thing, it was, I was learning a lot about the kind of top line I wanted to be. But, like, there are clearly kind of shackles on the rest of what I could do. Right. And so I was like, okay, I just need to be somewhere else. I am done. This environment, the entire paradigm of brotocracy, broville, I need to be out of here. And so I just kind of cut fast. And I cut with one degree of separation because there are people that, whose minds were like controlled by that paradigm. And that as helpless, you know, like, you, you just, you're trying to explain what you're trying to do, and there's no one that they know, and their friends are useless. And everyone is like, just a, an avenue back to the same problem you have. Mm. So I cut with one degree of separation. Right. And I was like, I am starting from scratch. I think five people survived. And I was like, right. Um, I need to rehash my networks. I need to get a solid idea of what I'm doing. I have nothing. <laughs> um, um, the control machine started kind of... I was useful to a number of people, so I had to move house and change my phone number. Mm. Like, it was it was unreal, the kind of... You made a real break. The break was right. real, and, and then I just took a hiatus from music for three years. I did a few songs, writing-wise. I just kind of kept that bubbling along at a very low level. Yeah, yeah. But fortunately, one of them got the, into the top ten... Really? Yeah. What was that? Um, I did a little kind of kind of EDM um, pop crossover song, uh, you know, um, with a guy um, called Sub Focus, and it's like just a dancey thing. And like you do at that, the does, time, does it have your name attached to it? Is oh it no! Like the artist featuring you? No, 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 no. Right. I was just I'd call it a featured non-feature. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's that's interesting to have a song that's a hit and like and you don't wind up getting any sort of. No, no that was on purpose. That, right? that was by design. Okay. Okay. I was like, when I debut, it's gonna look like I came out of nowhere. Right. On purpose. Right. Because I want the opportunity to write my own story. Right. I don't want it to be written for me. And if there's one thing, certainly that happens for black women, like the second you do something, if I was a white guy, I could just go into hip hop from, you know, I could, I could just basically do a Beck basically and go around the genres all day, every day. Mm. But I have to say the word eclectic in every interview. I have to, <laughs> I have to ungenre myself everywhere I go. Because mm, I, mean, I have, I think, I think genre hopping for anybody, even in the white robot, yeah, I think it's can really be kind of the hard. kiss of death, you yeah. know, for a lot of people. You yeah, know? it can be really hard. Yeah. It's not the easiest thing to do. But if your brand generally is a mix, right, right, then right, right. that's m more than hopping. Right, you right, know, right. genre hopping is the hardest thing to yeah, do. Yeah. It takes and like so, a Bowie or somebody like yeah, that. Yeah, that really exactly. Can, like, and it's it. really hard. Yeah. It, you're right. Yeah. And it's and so I knew that that was one thing that I had to just like. You know, if I wasn't pursuing it, 
as a main artist thing, which mm. I wasn't. I was like, I'm just writing. It's just sometimes they're looking for a vocalist and the only vocalist they can think of is me. Right. <laughs> and so... You were too like, damn good in the band. <laughs> and I refused to be in the band. And so it was always like, no, I've got a mission and I can't do that. Yeah. So genre hopping, you're right. It's, yeah. it's a whole thing. So I purposefully didn't feature on a bunch of stuff uh. to give myself the opportunity for doing what I really want to do when I get into the environment that's right, mm. that's healthy, that's conducive to me making the sound that I wanted to make that was about me. And it wasn't about serving the brief, you know? Yeah. And so this got to number 10. And then I did a vocal again, featured non-feature, a bit of where I was in the production team. So we're doing like the vocal stacks and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I always worked as like in the production teams as part of the vocal team guiding a, a singer through something mm. or um like biomechanically or doing like writing backing parts like i did like a christmas thing for katie perry and all the stacks were kind of arrangements that i did oh, and all wow. this stuff um or um, but in this case it was just like a few stacks and the top line that i yeah. sang but i didn't write but on the neighboring rights alone, I was golden because it got to number two mm. in the UK and the US. It was Duke Dumont, um, a song called Won't Look Back. And between that and the top 10 that I had, I was like, okay, I've got a choice. I've now got enough money to either build something, um, start building something um, of a solo career, or I could just buy a house and give up a music altogether. And because it's going to be the it's going to take the even amount of money of investment. Yeah. And so I wrote a business plan for myself and started acting on it. And uh, You are so much more organized than like 99% <laughs> of all musicians. I don't, I don't know anybody that ever wrote a business plan for their... That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that was everything that yeah. I had. And so yeah. if I was going to spend everything I have, I better have a plan for it. <laughs> well, so uh, in, in all that, how did you and Dan Auerbach wind up finding each other? Oh, he's uh -oh. gone. It's all right. I'll uh -oh. survive. Do we need a towel? We I did. think we might it's need a towel right. up here. I've only got one splash. I've Emergency nailed it so towel far. situation. I know. Drippy cup. What are you going to do? <laughs> Falls. We'll get it later. That's a cheap trick your manager played on you. I know. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's a, it's a slightly drippy situation that I'll survive. Um, yeah, so how did you and uh, Dan Auerbach find so each other? So part of this kind of investment run was I knew I was going to need to come to Nashville. Yeah, you can come up, Bubba. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. I know. Oh, that'll do. Oh, drippy cups are evil, aren't they? Um, so... Uh, Part of my plan, I'd come to, so in my band, we'd done a record in um, LA with um, Mark Ford, um, oh. previously of the Black Keys. The Black Keys, what are you talking Black about? Crows. I'm thinking about Dad. Yeah, yeah Black Crows. Ah, close foot, no cigar. And uh, I was, uh, and then we wrote, uh, me and my co writer wrote ourselves back across America. Um, our publicist, our publicist, our publisher set up um, some rights mm. and we came through Nashville okay. and I noticed like in LA, um, the co everything was so spread out and the opportunity for serendipity was super down there. Mm. It was because everyone's driving and you, and then all the parties, it's a rooftop thing and it's invite only. And like there's, it's all like just so sectioned off that whole, I'm going to bump into somebody halfway down the road or at the end of music row at that sandwich place or at that cafe that everyone goes to because it's the one near the office yeah, yeah. is like all of that wasn't happening. And then we got to Nashville and and this was 2010, so it's before all of this happened, oh, or really? the beginning of all the explosion of Nashville. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, people would go to the same place for lunch every, if they weren't getting lunch delivered to the office, you know. And so conversations would be happening, all of the serendipity of people going and talking during the lunch hour. Oh, have you seen so-and-so from so-and-so? Yeah, who have they got in? Oh, this person. And then they go back and talk to someone in the New York office or whatever. Oh, how's your day going? Yeah, yeah. Who have you got in so-and-so from so-and-so? Oh, what cities are they going through? Oh, blah, blah. And it was just that, that bump in. It meant that, you, that your name would go around a number of companies. And I noticed at that point that it was important that to be here mm. because 
it was small enough for people to have these serendipitous moments of bumping in, having conversations, wherever they're picking their kids up from after school club, the, like after the second session of the afternoon, that kind of regimented 10 to 1, lunch, 2 to 5 type thing. All of that kind of made for those serendipitous moments. And so um, we didn't get half the rights we were looking for in LA. Then we came to Nashville and we just got a bunch and that made the New York leg, as we were writing our way back to England, uh, even more kind of populated. Mm. And we were trying to set it all up before and then was like, yeah, whatevs. But just from being in Nashville and people talking, um, just everything changed. And I was like, that's because you've got so many houses close to each other, like with at least a room dedicated to a company. Yeah. You know? I'm always blown away at how willing to write with people yes. the writers are here. You know? They, yes. It's, it's kind of amazing. It's so different for that reason. It's so special for that reason. And I noticed that in 2010. So in 2016, when I was like, okay, I'm spending all my money on this, um, I was like, I'm definitely going to Nashville. You've, like, obviously. And so I come here for a, um, the my first Americana fest, and I'd done um, the Americana UK um, event. And if you kind of did well in that, they'll bring out a contingent of Brits to mm. here. And so I came up with the contingent of Brits, and uh, uh, that's where. Um, with the help of uh, my still publicist, Doug Hall, um, um, just spreading um, my name around and it did a good old circuit of Nashville. Um, NPR were very kind and, and, and Powers was very kind in tipping me um, early doors. And so I got a little bit of like all of this kind of first round of PR which went pretty good. It was a pretty good year. Yeah. I had a bunch of meetings with a bunch of people, um, all of which I was like, you all gross me out. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that in the meeting? <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just like, I was getting into a situation where it was just loads of what we call Johnny Giant Balls, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. I've never heard that term. Johnny, Johnny Giant Balls is the... Okay, so... <laughs> Oh, you weren't expecting this, were you, babes? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, so Johnny Giant Balls is the guy that invites you into his office and he sits on a perfectly acceptable chair behind a desk. And then he gives you a little clown chair. <laughs> or, or he gives you a very nice chair, but it's, maybe it's like... It's not the same chair. Right. Like, we're having a conversation, yeah. so we're on the same right. level, <laughs> right. same chair. Yeah. Like, if I was on a yoga ball or something, I'd be like, what are you trying to do right, to me? Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, now that you mention it, I think I have encountered uh, Johnny Giant Balls a yeah. time or two in this business. I, I remember that now. <laughs> yes. Yes, all musicians at some point, yeah. especially if you're talking to the bigwigs, may have seen Johnny and his giant balls. And <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and so they put you on the kind of like the reclining chairs. So you just can't get comfortable or and so there you are and you're kind of your legs are kimbo, your guts hanging out mm. like uh, it's all, you know, nothing's right. You know, I'm really trying to. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then they, they go, they sit from there, thrown upon high, and just disseminate how amazing they are. And you're like, thank you, sir, and bow and curtsy. No, if you would only consider. <laughs> <laughs> Hunchback and ruddy well Notre Dame. It's a ruddy chart, mate. Anywho, and I'm just like, so what I was doing, I was going into offices here, and if they had the mistake of having one and an arm on it, I just drag it to the edge of the table, the same distance they were away, turn the arm around and sit on the arm at exactly the same level, or just rearranging, oh, my, my, I come in and I go, this won't do, love. And I <laughs> rearrange the room until I could experience it in an adult way. And <laughs> so 2016 was like just going through various Johnnies and their humongoid junk um, <laughs> and uh, um, and just dealing with 
their superiority complex and um, once I exp uh, and once I got through that and I experienced people walking into a room and going, oh, so you have an Afro and flares and you sing country-influenced music. Okay, I get it. I'm like, wow, so I haven't even started talking yet. Mm. And like the kind of, you know, um, black reductiveness was pretty massive. And so once I got over that hump, I was like, okay, round two, I don't know when I do this, I'm going to be really selective over who I meet. I'm going to make sure that when I look him in the eye, they look at me like, I'm looking at you now. Right. With just the, we're engaging, connections happening on a human level. This is nice. This is all I wanted. But like I said, <laughs> <laughs> this is literally, yeah. it's not that hard. Right. This is literally yeah. all I wanted. Anyway, people struggle at exactly yeah, this. Generally not the dynamic in this business. <laughs> <laughs> and so 2017 yeah. came round, I did Americana Fest again. And I had meetings with people and it was all very, a lot more meaningful. I met my manager, who very kindly delivered this to me. And <laughs> we'd met before, we'd been talking for about a year and we kind of were sealing the deal at that time. Um, and um, my name did a bigger circle. Thanks again to good old Doug. Um, <laughs> a bigger circle and it bumped into Dan's people or a friend of Dan's and British Underground, um, talking to this lovely Aussie fellow and he was really tight with Dan and they were so through those channels of connection we're like people are like we think you need to hear this and so Charlie my manager takes a photo uh, a photo a video and sends it on through um, these channels and he sees the video and was like so um, can we get her in now 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 how about now? And, I'll, and then they were like, we'll have a look at your diary. And the next available spot was a couple months later. And so I went back to England and then I flew back in two months and we started writing, I think we were at Shady Grove. Oh, so yeah. you and Dan write together. Yeah. Um, and he'd always like have some surprise third guest of fabulosity. He'd be like, Bobby Woods or Dan Penn or well, yeah. some okay, to legend of the highest order. I wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you about riding with Dan Penn in, in particular. Mm. But for people who, who aren't familiar, uh, who don't know who Dan Penn is, who, who is Dan Penn? Uh, well, um, you may be acquainted with the songs Do Right Woman <laughs> or uh, Dark End of the Street. <laughs> Little known yeah. songs like that. Mem uh, Mem Memphis legend. Yes, yeah. and a stone cold Memphis legend and the walking, talking crossover of country and soul. Right. You know, if I know the number of times that people go, so country soul, like, like oh, that's an interesting mix. I'm like, no, it's not. Dan Penn exists. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, what, what's right that, there. What's that like in a room writing with a guy like that who you, you know, of course, I'm sure it's just a gigantic fan of his work. Yes. I mean, do you, do you ever get, like, can you get comfortable going like, no, I don't like your idea? Well, no, not really. <laughs> Do you have those moments? It's like he's so legitimate. You're just like, even if you, like, if you don't understand it, it's probably right. right. No, um, <laughs> no uh, like, um, I was talking about, um, uh, we started by just having a conversation. He goes, tell me a little bit about yourself. And so I was like, well, we've, I've, we've done, we've done a few writing sessions by this time. And, oh, excuse me, this is going to happen. T. Um, <laughs> um, and I was like, well, do you know what? I was uh, in a house fire somewhat recently, and I was kind of a human torch. And as I was burning, I found myself laughing my merry ass off. And he's like, what? And I'm like, well, you know, I had to think of something worse than being on fire to break myself out of what they call static shock. Mm. Like, you either run around like a headless chicken, you know, the fight or flight thing. I was right. just like... You, you were literally on fire. Yeah, it was Christmas time in, my, in the middle of my three-year hiatus from music. Uh, and, uh, or just, you know, back, back second, third. And uh, I was wrapping presents and I was testing a bioethanol burner Mm. which is like a table centerpiece, like a candle. Like, yeah. You know, you have those candle arrangements. It's like a arrangement um, that you have a little bit of bioethanol in that soaks a wick or 
like just in a reservoir and it has that little pretty yeah, dancing yeah. flame gives off a tiny bit of heat and you know it's a, it's a cute thing for a table <laughs> anyway um until it burns your house down and yeah, you. until it, it until it sets you on fire. Um, it worked perfectly fine, but the little canister of bioethanol that had one of those, you know, screw tops, and it just wasn't quite adhering the way that you would like. It wasn't quite closing to. So you'd pour it, and there'd be a very invisible little drip happening. You know what alcohol's like? When it hits a surface, it disappears. It's not... You don't see it as liquid because right. it evaporates mostly mm. not completely sadly so um when i lit it i was like oh this looks nice and then a little trickle came out of the reservoir clearly where it's just been dripping as i've been <laughs> taking it up to it and caught the canister and the canister goes oh jesus and then another little trickle clearly from where i've just been holding it <laughs> goes up my dress up my hands and I'm <laughs> my dress goes up and so at this point I'm burning and I'm like obviously in shock because it's accelerant so it happens very quickly and the songwriter in you is like oh this is gonna be great <laughs> 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 yes! I got so much fuel this here. is gonna be so yeah. good <laughs> yeah. Dan Penn and Dan Auerbach are still sitting here at this point <laughs> listening to exactly what I'm telling you right now. So you are Dan Penn right now. And uh, and I'm like, and so I, I have to think of something worse because obviously the speed of it, you just go into shock. It's like involuntary. And I thought of the first 30 years of my life. And I've told you a little bit about it. I've not gone into any of the detail because it's just truly so harrowing. I'm not getting into it. I don't deserve to put myself through that again. And you can ask and ask till the cows come home. Not today. Maybe not ever. I'll decide if. And um, uh, I thought back to that time and I was like, I'd take my life now plus fire any day of the week. And I just started laughing. I was laughing so hard. I was like, oh yeah, stop, drop and roll. So I stopped, dropped and rolled. <laughs> Oh yeah, put myself out. Yeah, right, but I was that. like, I wasn't static anymore because I was laughing, and like yeah. obviously the kind of the chemicals you get from laughing um, are the antithesis of cortisol, which is very helpful. So there I am, rolling and rolling, snuffing and snuffing and snuffing, and uh, I'm no longer burning, which is great. Um, and I'm like, right, okay, but here still is, and I'd like to ideally live here. So I go outside, get a hose, come back in, and I put the fire out myself. And my neighbour comes and helps lean on the door to help with the backdraft. And so we're just like putting it out for boy about half an hour, mm. uh, 45 minutes. And then the uh, fire brigade turn up and they're like, oh, you've done it. I'm like, yeah. I'm feeling pretty uh, triumphant, to be honest, babes. And I, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah, I'm just there, like, you know, just grinning from here to here going, <laughs> Life's really good. I'm loved. It's great. And I, you know, like to go into the smallest part of it, I kind of throw away commented living on the streets, but I did. And in that time of my life, with all of my friends that we've now discovered are douche, were douchebags, um, <laughs> well, like uh, I had just a situation where I needed to live. I, I need to move out of the house that I was in. And I need somewhere to stay. And everyone was like, I'm oh, sorry, it's not convenient. Oh, I'm sorry. I like, you know, uh, I've got like a cat. Oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> like it was the whole kind of thing. So, and like, it was just everyone, same kind of, I don't give a crap whether you live or die crew. Yeah. And so I ended up living in a big kind of hold all kind of gym bag in a bush sleeping, zipped up in a bush in East London for a few days and then begging, um, trying to get money and to be able to call someone to come fetch me to Bristol um, where I grew up and I knew I at least had one friend who wasn't a douchebag um, and only one though. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and that friend did come and get me as I thought they would and mm. <laughs> And uh, yeah, like I realized at 
post-burning and looking at, I can't live here for at least a few months until they remodel it, um, that I had too many places. I had too many places. I had too many people that gave a crap. And people that I'd known for a long time that had been pushed away because they weren't in the mental paradigm I was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, people who I'd newly connected with, everything in between. Um, just people that were just full of love and were not mentally compromised by that weird world yeah. um, that governs so much of music. Um, and like, I was just like, I'm totally cool. I feel like I just, I could just go to my mate's house and like, you're probably burned. You probably need to go to intensive care. <laughs> um, I think you need to go to ICU. And so I went to ICU and lo and behold, I was burned. And uh, so I just got wrapped up like a mummy, given loads of gas and air. I was laughing my ass off the whole time, just uh, with uh, my mate and who came with me and, yeah, I'm just like, I was just full of joy. And so I was talking to Dan Penn and Dan Aga back about this, and they were like, let's write a song about this. And that's where Walk Through Fire came from. Mm. Yeah. And do, do you bring in songs? Like, did you bring songs to those sessions that were yeah. pretty fully formed, and then you guys tinkered with them and yeah. changed them up? Well, or were you just like creating new songs in the studio? Um, Both. Right. And so mostly the latter, right. just trying to react to what it would sound like if all three people were in the room right. instead of necessarily trying to impose someone's will in one direction it was like but what does it sound like if all three mix evenly right which is the, the a wonderful thing you can get from writing um is that kind of the commonplace looked at from three different angles yeah. um but it's the, the beauty of collaboration. It really. is. Yeah. It is at its best. It gets things. It sees things from angles that you can't see from, and um, which is why it's so important to write with different people all the time. You know, I, um, I hate to do a hard left turn here, but I'm getting the wrap it up sign. From, yeah. From my people over there, and well, I have no, one last good. question that I wanted to ask it's you about. It's all good. I wrote one on my own. That was <laughs> it. It ain't easier. I brought that in, and that was pretty much as is. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was just me. Well, okay, so I've been over to the UK a bunch in the last couple of years. Yeah. And, um, and I just wanted to, you know, since we're talking about traumatic events that, uh, that influence your art, um, it seems to me over in the UK, and, and like, you know, obviously we have our own traumatic political mm -hmm. world happening here right now, but, but you guys have your own with Brexit. And the thing that, yes. that um, the feeling that I get over there with my friends that mm -hmm. live in, in, in the UK is this, this, this uncertainty and stress of what the fuck is going to happen how is yes. this going to play out i mean how is that affecting you as a you know as a person or just as is that oh, is gosh. that influencing your writing now well the thing is is that i'm never home mm, there you go <laughs> so in a weird way because i'm never there like i've got a very maybe muted experience comparatively to people that will come to Americana Fest or come do a tour and then go home and be home. I'm actually letting go of the apartment. I've been that same apartment that I had the fire in. Mm. I still technically live in. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> but I will not be living there <laughs> because I've not, I, I would have been in it for 10 of the 12 months I'm paying for it. No, I would have not been in it for 10 right. of the 12 months. Right, right, right. And so I'm just not in the UK. And so I've got a kind of maybe a muted experience of everything. Right. I'm fully aware of um, the fact that things are supposed to be happening on the 31st and I'm supposed to be doing a European tour on the 1st of November. <laughs> and so that's gonna be an interesting little hippity hop over. Sure. But I'm very fortunately looked after by WME who are not by any means a small company. No. And uh, one is hoping that uh, their humongous machine has managed to negotiate some sort of plan. As a contingency plan there. As a contingency yeah. for a giant multinational. Yeah, let's hope. It's gonna be it's yeah, it's gonna be a new world, I guess. It's gonna soon, be yeah. a for touring. It, yeah, it's um it's just a hot mess is the truth. It's a hot, hot mess. Absolutely galloping douchebags, left, right, back and centre. Like 
<laughs> Sociopaths. I think of we the just came up order. with a name for your tour. I know. <laughs> Gallop. <laughs> The Enduring of Galloping Douchebags Tour. <laughs> On that note, we, we have to end it. You have been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Give it up for Yola. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. A song so Yola on walking the floor. How cool was that? She was awesome, and the crowd was awesome. I like doing these live walking the floor tapings. I hope we do a whole bunch more. I managed to do a few of them while I was out there at Americana Fest, so uh, a couple more coming up in that style. It's different when you're in front of people. I don't know. It's a different deal. The one thing is it's actually kind of hard to hear the person you're interviewing, I noticed. It's hard to... It's a different... It's a... how, what am I trying to say? It's a, it's a strange way to have a conversation with somebody when you're sitting there in front of a room full of people, but it's super fun. I dig it. All right, so that's it for this week. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. I don't know which one. I got a lot to choose from. Could be Robert Earl Keane. Could be Jack Ingram. Could be Randy Hauser. Could be Tony Brown. Could be Kendall Marvel. I don't know. I'm not going to make that decision just yet. I'm going to leave you hanging. Okay, adios, amigos. Ooh.